you talk about COVID-19, about the pandemic and the U.S. response to that. Uh, how much of how much of these uprisings are as a result, not only, of course, of the long history of white supremacy in the United States, but also how the United States, the government of the United States has dealt with this pandemic? Has that laid the groundwork for this uprising in your view? Well, a number of commentators have juxtaposed Mr. Trump's reaction to our men entering the Capitol in Lansing, Michigan. And he suggested that Governor Whitmer negotiate with these men. Uh, He, of course, referred to some of them as good people, as opposed to the reaction to what he called thugs in the streets of Minneapolis when you had the protests at the White House, both uh, last night and the day before, he talked about ominous weapons and vicious dogs mm-hmm. that he was waiting to unleash against these protesters. And so if you have so, this sort of mindset uh, emanating from the highest office in the land, well, it's not surprising that on the street level, there's street justice, if you like, executed against uh, unsuspecting black men like George Floyd. I mean, the fish begins to rot from the head first, and obviously the fish in the Oval Office is rotting and emanating and giving off a a hell of a stink. And so that's my short answer to your question. Hmm. Okay. Uh, And I, I guess I just want your thoughts on how these uprisings we're now seeing fit within the legacy of, of uprisings uh, throughout U.S. history, um, oh, yes. I was mm-hmm. thinking. I was thinking about. I had a friend that actually was really excited that I was interviewing you again, and he had read uh, your book on the Watts riots in the yes. 1960s. He wanted to point to that, and I wanted to point to that as well. So again, I guess the the question is how does these upri- how do these uprisings currently fit within a legacy of uprisings in the United States? Um, and also, what do you based on these previous examples of uprisings, what are some of the anticipated outcomes that we can maybe look towards uh, with these, uh, with these uprisings today? Well, one of the striking differences between Watts in 1965 and what's going on today is that what's going on today is more national from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Pacific, and, And to that extent, it resembles more what happened on April 4th, April 5th, 1968, after the slaying of Martin Luther King, when there was, there were revolts from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Uh, Secondly, uh, I think there's a parallel between the so-called Rodney King rebellion in Los Angeles in 1992 and what's going on today, because in the former, there was an attack on the police department, their headquarters. And in some senses, that's where it all began that that uh, the first night of unrest and here you've had the white house being under siege you've had the state capital in columbus ohio the security being breached you've had a torching of the police precinct in minneapolis closest to where george floyd was killed and i think that those attacks on state power are very significant and need to be pondered very carefully. Now, with regard to how this will eventuate, um, part of the problem is that in the 1960s, and particularly by the time of the Martin Luther King slang, you had a Black Panther Party, a centralized, organized political formation with chapters from the Atlantic to the Pacific. But what happened, as you well know, is that it was bludgeoned into extinction. And that now has given rise to sort of decentralized, leaderless rebellions. I mean, Black Lives Matter, which you could see as an analog, is very decentralized. And and I think it's a reaction to when you have this centralized organization, you know, the government then goes after the leaders. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. Their organ- okay, so fine. So you, so you, you had this uh, adaptation. The, the, the problem is trying to effectuate change to influence the centralized entity that is the United States of America 
or the state government in St. Paul without having some sort of centralized formation of your own. And that does not necessarily bode well. However, on a more positive note, just like the 1960s, you have a lot of global publicity with regard to what's going on. I mean, I've done interviews in the last few days with Turkish media, Russian media, tomorrow it's Iran. And I think that that global publicity uh, hopefully will be wind in the sails of the protesters today. But once again, it's going to be hard to take advantage of that uh, without some sort of leadership. I mean, somebody sitting across the table with the representatives from Cuba at their embassy in Washington, for example. So it, 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 it's going to it's going to be very difficult, but you know, I'm, I'm hopeful. Right. Um, and I guess th- there has been these. I'm just want to get your insights into this. Uh, we have seen with a lot of these protests, of course, these uprisings. There has been um, what has been defined as looting, of course. Um, and then uh, there's another element to this that's been coming up more recently, which is. It, there, it, it, this is hard to kind of suss out for myself. Uh, I'm seeing that it's kind of both, where you see the police, I think in Minneapolis or, or elsewhere, they've blamed outside agitators for what's happening in their city. And I feel like that's often used as a way to delegitimize the the anger and the rage that we're seeing. But I also see that there is, in fact legitimate claims now being made that uh, white supremacists and other outside groups are coming into these protests, into these demonstrations, and um, causing mayhem, basically. Uh, And I just want to know how that fits, if there is any other uh, corollaries or any other examples that we can look to in recent or, or maybe deeper into the United States history of outside agitators or white supremacists or other groups coming in to cause mayhem and delegitimize in the public eye at least delegitimize the uh the aims of these uprisings and protests well i think you framed the issue nicely that is to say that obviously this trope of outside agitator has been used to make illegitimate uh, protests that have all the legitimacy in the world uh, i even saw or was made aware of a tweet who blamed a, tw- a, t- a tweet post that blamed the protests on um, Russia. And that this is just another example of Moscow uh, stirring up the Negroes, uh, for example. And as you know, there's a long discredited history of anti racist protests being seen as no more as being the pawns of Moscow. At the same time, we're also aware of a parallel and companion history of COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program of the FBI that used dirty tricks to try to destabilize legitimate movements. And Michelle Goldberg, the columnist from the New York Times, in her column just another a day or so ago, linked to a column that went into some detail about white supremacists uh, coming into Minneapolis to try to stir up issues because they saw this as a way to promote what they called a quote, race war, unquote. All this shows that, you know, we're facing a very complicated political situation and I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I think it it really does bespeak how, you know, I, I know it's going to sound a little old fashioned, but pardon me. But, you know, we, we, need, some, we need some leadership. I mean, we, we need some organization. Um, because all of the people who are trying to destabilize us are organized, <laughs> basically. Mm, mm-hmm. And uh, they have leaders. And, uh, and like I said, I understand historically why there's been a movement away from that model. But I'm not sure if it's going to be sufficient to meet this current moment. 